All right, guys, so here we are once again in our philosophy of religion course. Now, <clears throat> as you've probably noticed, what we're doing thus far is we're not going super deep, but we're, di we're starting to touch on some of these classical uh, arguments for the existence of God, and I just disappeared. That's all right. We'll get, we'll get up, back up here in just a second. Um, there I am. All right, so we're starting to touch on these classical arguments for the existence of God, um, these classical philosophical arguments that, you know, as, as we've mentioned multiple times, that don't necessarily depend upon uh, any sort of scientific discovery or inquiry, so to speak, or observation. Uh, when, when I say observation, I mean in, in the sense that we would normally use the scientific method now. I'm not talking about induction, uh, those types of philosophical principles that obviously come into play when we talk about uh, science and the philosophy of science. Now, you're gonna what what will probably happen here is you're gonna see that in this course is, there's gonna be more video than normal, but they're gonna be much shorter in, dur in duration. So, uh, <clears throat> having said that, let's go ahead and look at this version of the, what is called the Neoplatonic argument uh, for the existence of God. Now, again, we're going to follow, uh, for the most part, uh, philosopher Ed Fazer's lead here. Uh, and we're going to look at these modern formulations of these ancient classical arguments. Now, that's not to say, when we say modern formulation, we're not uh, departing from the... the, the the classical roots of the argument. That is just to say that we're updating any sort of uh, scientific uh, example that may have been given in the day that's no longer, uh, uh, that, that we obviously see is not true, things like that. Um, again, again, as Phaser notes, we're getting off the uh, accidental husk and getting to the, the core of the kernel of the argument there. Um, and as Phaser has noted as well, Remember, we're not going to give exactly the same sort of uh, argument that Plotinus may have given, uh, or as previously said, uh, uh, Aristotle, but the, the heart of the actual argument. So it still is, uh, by virtue of itself, an Aristotelian argument or a Neoplatonic argument. Now, this argument, this version of a cosmological argument, um, is going to come from a philosopher named Plotinus. Now, Plotinus, like Aristotle, was another pagan um, philosopher. Um, now, you may be wondering thence, wh where, where does this uh, Platonic, right, this, this reference to uh, Plato come from, right? Well, because around this time, the, the, around the 300s or so, somewhere in there, you had a new school of thought that was derivative of uh, Plato, the Platonic school of thought, uh, but with tweaks, updates, uh, being rid of some particular things, adopting some other particular things, right? Um, so it was Platonic still at its core in some sense, but what's called Neoplatonic. Now, Plotinus was a Neoplatonic philosopher, uh, as was Augustine. Um, St. Augustine was uh, Neoplatonic in his, his, his philosophical outlook, his school of thought, so to speak. Uh, obviously, he incorporated that into his Christian worldview, right? He, he was... Uh, Ultimately, he was he had a Christian worldview, but as it, as he understood philosophical matters, metaphysical uh, questions and answers, he, he took that from more of a Neoplatonic school of thought. Now, enough of that. Let's go ahead and start to look at some of what this argument would say. This is actually a pretty cool little argument. Um, it. Just like when we looked at the Aristotelian argument that talked about cause and effect um, in the sense of actual to potentials, right? What, what actualizes certain potentials, what brings potentialities to actual states of affairs, right? Um, and that was something else actual. Something actual has to bring about potentials. Potentials can't actualize themselves, right? Now, this argument is going to be similar to that in the sense that it is going to be uh, based on just common sense, a common sense type observation of, of, of our surroundings. Now, as noted here, all things that, so let's get into it. All things that we observe is or are made up of parts, right? So we have all sorts of examples of this. Um, 
<laughs> again, so just this first statement here, the first proposition that all things that we observe is or are made up of parts. <clears throat> if that's true, then not only do we have all sorts of examples, then virtually anything of it our experience, Phaser would even say it this way, all things within our experience or direct experience are composed of parts. So you're not just going to have a few examples. Uh, it's just anything we observe, right? anything that we have direct experience with. Now, I want you to think of, let's say, a book or a chair. Um, let's stick with Phaser's example of a chair. A chair is composed, right? It is composed of parts, right? Uh, a chair is not just the quote unquote chair, right? The chair has legs. It has a seat. Uh, sometimes it may have arms. It has a back to it, right? It has supporting structure, right? The things that hold the thing uh, in ex uh, up and around itself, right? The constituent parts of a chair make up the chair, right? Now, this is also true in regard to a book, say this book that I'm holding now. Um, the parts of it, right? The particular pages of the book, uh, the spine of the book, the front cover, the back cover, right? All of these things make up the book, right? Again, just to continue to go down the line of our examples here on the, on the on the PowerPoint, vehicles are composed of parts. Uh, a vehicle is composed of constituent parts, right? There are the wheels, there are the tires, right? There are uh, seats, there are uh, your front and your rear axle, um, you know, your engine. Uh, all, of, all of the various components that make up that one particular vehicle, it's made up of parts. Now, this is not just true of what Aristotle would call artifacts, right? Things that we make. But this is also true in regard to biological systems, right? Um, this, is, this is true in regards to trees, right? You have the bark, uh, you have the sap, you have the leaves uh, that, uh, that take in the sunlight. You have uh, chlorophyll, uh, depending on what type of, type of you know, tree it is. All of these constituent parts, right? There's a tree, right? but it's made of constituent parts. It has components about it, it has features, right, about it. Now, even we as human beings are composed, right? We, we, have a, we, have, we are made of constituent parts. You know, a human being may have two arms. He may have one arm, he may have two legs, he may have one leg, he may not have any legs, right? He may have lost them, but whatever the case may be, he's composed of these things, right? <clears throat> His, his torso, uh, his waist, his, his ears, his eyes, his, his mouth, his tongue, his teeth, his knees, right, his shoulders, all of the things that make us, make up uh, the human person, um, there are parts to us, right? There are features, right? We are not simple in the sense of existing, uh, in, uh, existing in, in, in one complete oneness, right? We, we, we're, we're composed, right? We have constituent parts. We're complex. And that goes for all of these examples, even, if, even as I look around the room here, uh, these books behind me, the, the shelf, uh, this, this phone here, right? Um, all of these things are composed, even though they're one thing in one sense, they are complex in another sense that they are composed of constituent parts, Right? So we've, we've got that down, right? It seems to be nailed down that the things of our experience are uh, composed, right? Now, if it's true that all things that we observe, all things we experience directly are made up of parts, right? Um, and then we have all of these various examples. Um, it seems that in one sense, the parts are less fundamental than the whole, right? Because the parts, in order to make sense of the parts, right, in order to make sense of, say, the legs on the chair, the back of the chair, the seat of the chair, in order to make sense of those, those are just merely the parts of the chair in and of itself, right? The, the chair exists, um, or we should say, let me say it this way, the, the, the parts wouldn't make any sense, right? except in light of the whole of the chair, right? So if you see chair legs just laying around by themselves, they don't really serve much of a purpose. They don't really make much sense. They don't really exist for the sake of themselves, right? 
they they seem less fundamental than what they exist for, which would be the chair in and of itself taken as a whole, right? And this would be true of each component part, right? Of each feature of the chair, the back, uh, the seat, the legs, the the arms, right? And this would go for any of our examples that we've talked about for uh, thus far, the car, right? The vehicle, the book, right? The one particular page doesn't make much sense, right? Um, except in light of the whole of the book, right? Um, so in one sense, the parts are less fundamental than the whole of what the thing is in and of itself, right? Um, so it seems like that, well, yeah, you actually need the whole to make sense of these parts because they're really less fundamental uh, than, uh, th than the whole is itself now however this is this is kind of this, here's a tricky thing though right because some of you may actually be uh you may be at one step ahead of the game here you may see exactly where this is going so if our last statement is well, wait a minute in one sense the partial is fundamental in the whole well what about this next statement check this out but in another sense, the whole is less fundamental than the parts. Wait a minute, what? A minute ago, we just said, well, wait, you know, in one sense, the, the parts are less fundamental than the whole. But now we're saying, well, but wait a minute. In another sense, the whole is less fundamental than the parts. How so? Well, think about it. What's, what's the best way to explain this here? The whole can exist without the parts, right? The whole, right, the chair as a whole depends upon the legs, depends upon the arms, depends upon the back, depends upon the, the rear, right, the seat. It depends upon each of these constituent parts, e each of these composites, it depends upon these for it to exist at all. So if you were to talk about a chair, right, but you don't have the legs, you don't have the seat, you don't have the back, then you really just don't have a chair, right? So in that sense, the chair as a whole is dependent, is less fundamental than the parts of the chair because the chair is dependent upon the parts for its very existence, right? Otherwise, you just don't even have a chair. Or uh, if you think in terms of the vehicle. If you don't have the tires, if you don't have the wheels, if you don't have the rear axle, the front axle, the, the hood of the car, the seats, the steering column, and so on and so forth, you just don't have a car, right? The whole of the car is dependent upon the parts that make up uh, the whole of the car. So we seem to be in some kind of, sort of conundrum. In what sense? What In what way would you say that, if you need to pause it and think through this here for a moment, in what way would you say that we, we might be in some sort of problem here? Why might we be in some sort of difficulty? I'm going to give you just a, th a chance to think of that for a, a, uh, for a second. Now, if you pause and thought about that for a minute, the next question is, if the parts seem like they're dependent upon the whole in some sense, yet the whole seems like it's dependent upon the parts in some sense, both for their, like to the, this unifying feature to make sense of either one, right? Within, in the words of Phaser, how do the parts, right? How do the parts of a composite come together to form the whole, right? If the whole is dependent on the parts in some sense, and yet the parts are dependent upon the whole in some sense, well then, how do the parts and the whole come together to unify, to make this unifying concept, right? Or this unifying existent out of these constituent parts that can't be explained one without the other. It's kind of like the which comes first chicken and the egg kind of question, right? How do you explain? You can't appeal to the, the whole to explain the parts and you can't appeal to the parts in order to explain the whole. So what makes sense of this? What provides this unification here to make this one real existent sort of thing, right? Now, 
again, as Phaser might want to say, it's obvious when you think of things like, think of this like in temporal terms, right? Like, oh, well, you know, you got the guy who makes the chair, you know, as he puts all these pieces together, that's what does it. But remember, um, his other example might be something like, you know, we also have something like even human development, which is not this way, right? All of these things, the cellular, cellular development, uh, it can happen simultaneously, right? You may have all sorts of parts that are developing simultaneous with the others, right? And this may be even true in regards to, uh, to acorns, right? As they turn into full-blown trees, as oak acorns turn into full-blown oak trees, right? That, it, that you can't just appeal to it in a temporal sense because uh, there's simultaneous uh, uh, generation, so to speak, going on there. Yet there's still something that is uniting all of these features, right? All of these parts, all these components, all these contingent things into this one unifying whole. But again, it can't be the whole, right? Because it's dependent upon the parts. Yet it can't be the parts because they're dependent upon the whole in some sense. So what can we appeal to then to try to get us to this? What, what gets us this? unifying what what is doing this unifying right now let's go to our next slide here first just to reiterate this once again again the things of our experience right are composite right as if we haven't <laughs> as we haven't drilled that down uh in super strong fashion at this point oh hang on a second you may be able to hear in the background here dave brubeck's take five Can you hear that? If you can't, I don't know, man. I'm sorry. Just Google or YouTube, uh, Dave Brubeck, uh, take five. Nice little jazz piece there. Perfect for this kind of talk. Anyway, let's keep going. So the things that, that of our expense are composite, right? And yet we, we seem to understand that there are these unifying ideas or these concepts of the existence, but all of these things are composed of parts, yet we can't make sense of what brings all of these parts together, uh, to unify them, right? And then what is it that unifies uh, all of the parts, or rather we should say, what bring, what, what is the cause of these, of this unified thing, right? What is bringing all of these parts together, especially in biological systems? Things that aren't, again, what Aristotle would call accidents, right? Man-made sorts of things. Now that might be something of a clue in the sense that we can see that what brings apart things that we make, right? What brings all, all the parts of this, the, the the inkwell or the ink, uh, uh, I guess, I don't know what you call these things, inkwell inside of the actual shell of the pen here, uh, the clicker, the little uh, contraption where you clip to a shirt. We see that there has to be some sort of agent external to this thing, right? External to this thing, external to this thing, right? Uh, that takes all of these parts and unites them to form some sort of coherent uh, thing, right? where all these things coincide working together, right? Now, we're starting to, as you see where that's starting to go, it's starting to kind of elude to, right, mysteriously point to something other than itself. Now, Phaser wants to, would obviously want to say that in one sense, but he's also taking a different track here, right? What he would really want to point to is here, is that, What he would really want to say here, what he would really want to point to, the point of this kind of argument is to say that, that even the parts, right, are composed of what? Parts, right? And you can't keep appealing to, well, this explains this and this explains this because you're just going to continue to get that down. You're going to continue to just kick that explanation. Sometimes we say in, in philosophy every once in a while, uh, you're just kicking the can down the road, right? You're not explaining anything. You're just delaying the explanation because uh, you're having to appeal to, well, these parts, right? Do this. Well, those parts are made of parts themselves, right? Like the chair legs are made of, uh, you know, screws and, and nails and pieces of wood and various other, uh, uh, you know, constituents. Um, even down to the, well, the, those are made of molecules. Those are made of, you know, all, you just keep going and going and going. Um, until you might say something like, uh, well, you're down to the most basic form of, 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 of at the subatomic level, whether it be quarks or, or some sort of subatomic particles. I don't know. I'm not brushed up on my physics, but whatever they are. But even those things, right, 
are unified, right, to make some sort of particular whole, right? So the, the, you just start the, the process just, it's just inexplic inexplicable there, unless there's something that's actualizing that, even at the very moment, even at the very moment that it's existing here and right now. So let's go ahead and get down to that because we've kind of talked about this particular slide here about uh, how, what explains the whole, it cannot be explained by reference to the parts, yet the parts cannot be explained by reference to the whole, right? So let's keep going. Um, seems like we doubled up on that slide. It's all right. Now, All right, so basically we just got ahead of ourselves here in our, our talk. We just outran our slides, but that's okay um, because we can just kind of highlight that again. Again, what we're just talking about is uh, what can account for the unification of that which is, right? Especially if everything is just composite, right? Let's keep going. All right, so here's where we need to be. So what we want to say here at this point is that composites – as we see that composites have causes, right? That there has to be, some, and when I say composites, obviously I'm talking about uh, things that are composed, right? Even if that's the parts themselves, right? Even the composites are composite in some, in, in some sense. Yet this can't go on, as we started to touch on just a second ago, this can't go on ad infinitum. Otherwise, why not? If, if this goes on ad infinitum, right? just an infinite regress of causes. And you may be familiar with an infinite the problems of, of infinite regress um, because of your, your, your past studies on, say, something like the Kalam cosmological argument or just past philosophical studies. We know that it's never a good thing when we say, oh, this can be explained only on pain of infinite regress, right? That would be the quote there, on pain of infinite regress. Because when we have to appeal to on pain of infinite regress, it's basically admission, an admission that nothing's, nothing is, is, is explained at all, right? Because you're constantly just appealing to the explanation before that, 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 ad infinitum, and you're never explaining anything at all. There's no real explanation as to why something is here and now happening if you constantly have to push the, book, the metaphysical book back, right? It's only if the metaphysical book stops somewhere that you actually have a genuine explanation. And not only is it that the metaphysical book has to stop somewhere, somewhere in particular to have a genuine explanation, but remember, when we think back to our last lecture, lecture in regard to Aristotelian, the Aristotelian notion of causality, not just the linear form of causality, but the hierarchical, right, uh, a, a hierarchy of causes, that if there's not some sort of hierarchy of causes that's, that's causing and call, bringing something into existence here and now, well, then there's no explanation as to why something right now exists in and of itself here and now, right? So Fazer wants to point out that this type of argument, this, there's something that's unifying the parts of all things, right? Especially things that aren't, again, artifacts, things that we make. Then you can't explain to the parts because the parts are composed of parts, which are composed of parts, which are composed of parts, which are being unified in some sense, even at the subatomic level then there has to be something outside of that right now that's unifying those concepts. Um, and this thing, this is where we would start to go on into, um, in our thought, we can go ahead and just go to this last slide here because we'll, we'll camp out here for a second. But this is where we would start to go ahead and, and, and look at some of the attributes of what this, of what this cause would have to be like. Well, again, Plotinus is going to say that this thing is called the one, right? Plotinus is going to say that this cause is not itself complex um, because it itself can't be composed of parts. This is the big, big, big key of the argument is that this cause can itself be composed of parts because, well, why not? Well, because if it were composed of parts, well, then we would have to have some sort of explanation, right? as to why it exists and what gives unification to the parts, right, to the constituents, to the components of it itself, right? Because you can't appeal to the whole. Remember, this is the difficulty earlier, it, because the whole would depend upon the parts, but you can't appeal to the parts because the parts in one sense depend upon the whole. So this, what Plotinus calls the one, right, 
And what later Christian thinkers would call God, right? well, and, and, and Plotinus would mean God in one sense. We, we, there's, we don't need to get into that now. But the reason he calls it the one, and this is what is, is uh, enshrined in, in what Christian, classical Christian theology, or even just Judeo-Christian theology would call divine simplicity, that this existent God would have to be simple, meaning that it cannot, when we say that God would have to be divine, uh, divine simplicity, when we say that God would be, have, to, have to be simple, it doesn't mean uh, simple as in not, what's the best way to say this, not complex in what it can or can't do, so to speak. Simple in the sense that it's not and it cannot be composed of parts. This is why we would say that God can't have a can't have a body, right, or or arms or legs or or uh, be composed of matter, right. Um, this is why we would say that God can't uh, be bound within time, right, because to be bound within time implies change, right, um, and change uh, and to be composed of matter would just be to be uh, dependent upon the parts, right, for your existence, right? And we've seen the difficulty of trying to be, of trying to explain something in relation to being dependent upon its parts, right? Um, but God can't be dependent upon his parts, right? So therefore God couldn't have parts in that sense. We're not talking about uh, the incarnation, right? This is a different matter where the divine nature takes on human, takes on a, uh, takes on human flesh or takes on a human, human nature. We're not talking about that. That's a completely different type of lecture. Now, the question would be then, if this is the one, right, well, then how would we know, simply based on the fact that it would have to be simple, it can't be composed of parts, how will we know that there is just one, right, that there is just one God? Well, again, let's think back to our, what's called the indiscernibility of identicals, right? In order for there to be a difference between, if there were more than one of these, right, more of the one divine simplicity, right, if there were more than one, well, they would have to differ in some right way, right? But the only way in which they could differ would mean that one would have some particular feature that the other didn't have. But if one had some particular feature or lacked a particular feature that the other one had, then that's just to say that that one has a part, right? Some sort of component that it has that the other doesn't have. But if it does have some sort of component, then it's not perfectly simple, right? It's not the one, so to speak. It's not divinely simple or what we would say is uh, having divine simplicity. Now, let's see if I can think of anything else before we conclude on this, because I want to keep these somewhat brief. I know these aren't necessarily as popular, the arguments, but I know that there will be students here that will get something a lot out of this, then you'll want to pursue these further. One, because they're just classic, right? They haven't gone away for literally at this point for thousands of years. Um, but some of you, uh, especially the more the more in depth you want to go philosophically, um, you can get a lot of mileage out of these. You can get a lot of uh, not just entertainment, right, but a lot of truth. There's a lot of good stuff here. Got a lot of nuggets, uh, a lot of just in depth metaphysical issues that are going on here that you can really uh, chow down on, so so to speak. Now, Fazer goes goes to go on and say that. We could even talk metaphysics here in the sense of what is, right? Because if you think back to the, uh, the Aristotelian lecture, right, and the teleological argument that I gave you there, remember how I talked about things are composed of form and matter, right? Everything that exists, there's a formal cause to things and there's a material cause to things, right? They exist in that way. And of course you have the efficient, uh, the material, the final and the formal causes, but just the existence themselves would be composed of form and matter. Now, if you're if you're a step ahead of the game here, you would also notice that this is exactly why, say, something like Christian theology would say that God doesn't have is not composed of form and matter, right? Because that would be composed, right? That would be to be dependent upon parts or existence. So, as Aquinas would argue, that God just is His essence, just is existence, right? Just is His existence. So God is not composed of form and matter. Now, notice those aren't necessarily, or we can look at it this way, God is not uh, actual and yet has uh, potentials, right? Because those would be different components, right? Those would be features, right? Actuality and potentiality. So this is why the one also couldn't be, 
composed of actuality and potentiality, but it would have to be 100%, just as we concluded last lecture, it would have to be 100% pure, pure act, right? Purely actualized, right? It couldn't be, it would have to be timeless, changeless, no potential, uh, because all of those things in, in, uh, imply, uh, at least in worked out, would have to be imply some sort of constituent part, right? Some sort of component, some sort of non-simple way in which it exists. But if it is, if it was that, well, then there's no explanation for it at all. And we have to kick back, again, the metaphysical book to have any sort of explanation as to what does provide unification to things of constituent parts, things of components and, and whatnot. Now, there's a couple other things that we could talk about. However, let me just read you this right here. Let me just read this particular section out of, uh, out of, this, out of this text here. This might help you understand, again, the whole changeless and immutable aspect, right? Immutable just, just to mean it doesn't change at all, right? The one, right, God, must be changeless or immutable, for to change entails gaining or losing some feature. And if the one could gain or lose some feature, it would not be simple or non-composite. Rather, it would be a simple, it would be a simple or non-composite thing plus this feature, in which case the feature would be a part, and thus the one just wouldn't really be simple or non-composite. If the one is changeless or immutable, then it is also eternal or outside time. Since to be in time entails undergoing some change, it must also be eternal in the sense of neither coming into being nor passing away. For if it came into being, it would have a cause, which entails that it has parts which were combined at the time it was caused and it has no parts. If it could pass away, then that would entail that it has parts. It could be broken down into and again, it has no parts, right? So again, hopefully this just gives you another nice taste of, uh, of an argument, of a classical argument uh, for the existence of God. Again, we're going to go through, we're going to try to go through all of those, that, <clears throat> which we mentioned in the very first lecture, right? You can skip back to your slides if you want to see what those are, before going into a couple different arguments uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum. So we're going to have probably, again, more videos, more lectures, but they're going to be shorter uh, in duration than they would normally be. So with that said, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, hopefully it's short enough to where you can go back and listen to it again, chew on it, do some research on that if you want. <clears throat> again, this, you know, I don't, this is, I'm not necessarily assigning this text to you per se, but you've got that right. If you want to just glance and look at other strong arguments or go deeper into these particular arguments. And with that said, <clears throat> 